Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 169, Crossing the Streams, using board games to inspire RPGs. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash Tabletop Bellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us in our lobby the chat room here on Twitch. So tonight, we've got a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons about using board games to make maps for role-playing games. Now, we're going to talk about that, but then potentially expand into talking about other ways you can use board games or perhaps board game components to improve and work with your role-playing games. Now, tying in with that, we're going to have a review of Tales from the Loop, the board game, which is a board game version of a pen and paper role-playing game with quite a bit of crossover between those two. And as usual, we're going to wrap up by talking about the games we've been playing lately. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, Eric McLean about fun historical board games for a mini gamer. I really enjoy Hammer of the Scots, but I'll admit I haven't played many or any others. It's hard enough to get that played and i couldn't justify getting another oh that's fair not everyone's into board game and miniature games or historic games but hammer of the scots if you're gonna pick any of them i gotta say is a good one that is one of my favorite um in my opinion the best columbia block game and columbia block games are the ones where your units are represented by square blocks and instead of laying flat on the board they stand up But what the stand-up, it can be used as a fog of war, so you can't see what there is. And the other thing they do is they do a thing where your units have health and change. So when you take damage, you rotate your block, and when you recruit troops, troops, you rotate the other way, which is a really neat mechanic to have both of them in there. And Hammer of the Scots does, of course, the um, famous William Wallace uh, Braveheart series of battles. If you do dig that one, what I recommend checking out is Julius Caesar which uses the same system, but is sent back into the Caesar versus Pompeii wars in the Roman period. That is the closest to Hammer of the Scots, though I got to say Hammer of the Scots is better. Well, there we go. Well, next up, we got some comments on our Aqualin content. The Hob Meeple, the Hop Meeple says, that's a nice little two-player game. (laughs) Uh, Brett Player said, we like it a lot. And Games on Board says, looks cool. Well, thanks everyone for the comments. I got to say, Aquan's a neat little game. It's just nice, portable, good quality components and really simple to learn gameplay, but complex strategies when you play. It's kind of perfect for that abstract strategy game market. And for more info, just check out our review. All right, well, next we got some comments on our how low a price has to be before we buy a potentially bad game topic. (laughs) That's a Mm -hmm. mouthful. Well, Dan (laughs) Eisenhut says free. I don't have any room for any more bad board games and uh orn borchart says i can't resist a fire sale never could if that said if shipping is more than the cost of the game oh, yeah. likely even if not on sale i probably won't get it what i like about those comments is you got both extremes right well at least at least dan is willing to take them free i'm honestly at the point where i won't take a game even for free but yeah the whole i i Can't resist a fire sale. There are definitely those out there, and I definitely went through it. If you check out that podcast episode, I talk a bit more about it. But I love the fact that that I keep finding people. Like, this this has been um, an ever-growing bush of of content because we get comments on that particular topic over and over many times. And it's always one or the other. I've yet to see someone who's been like, 25 bucks. No, everyone's always like, no, I can't help it. If there's a sale, I buy it. Or, nope, I don't need it anymore. Yep, fair. Uh, We also got some feedback on our great single-player epic fantasy games. Uh, Victor Cintron said, nice list. Mm -hmm. Then the Reflight EQ2 says, I love this, but the gamer in me can't help but see the random pieces from different games being used together here. Yeah, so this is a blog post and article I published uh, just a couple weeks ago. And the image I used is a shot from one of our Gloomhaven games. And if anyone's watched our live streams or checked out the pictures I share, I like to add scenery to our Gloomhaven games. So in that picture, there are um, scenery from Mage Knight. There's some D&D scenery. There is a D&D miniature. There is a Warhammer Skaven Rat. And there is Hero Quest furniture all over the place, all on top of Gloomhaven tiles. So I totally get it. Anyone who doesn't like to mash up their games, that's going to give you a little bit of a twitch. 
And then <clears throat> Jay Barron's comments, I have to seriously question the validity of any list like this that doesn't have Tainted Grail Fall of Avalon on it. I've played all of those games, and they are not as good as Tainted Grail. I've played Tainted Grail through all expansions with each different character, and I haven't still seen the entirety of the branching storyline. All right, Jay, come on. You're going to question my validity because I missed one game? <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that was a little chug and cheek. Jay is someone we interact with quite often over on MeWe. Um, you know what? Jay's right. That should have been on the list. I don't know how we missed it. I went back through and I looked at Tainted Grail and I looked at how it ranked and Tainted Grail was set up to be the Gloomhaven killer by a lot of people. And a lot of people were calling it that. There are still a lot of people calling it that. Now I will note Gloomhaven's still sitting on number one on Board Game Geek, but Tainted Grail is like up in the 36s and it's moving up. So there's definitely a game to be had there. I did not play it myself. I do not have a copy of Tainted Grail, though I do know it is available in retail now. Though you don't get all the expansions you would have for the Kickstarter. So you know what? I, I, we were wrong. I, that should have been on the list. So if you check out our list of 14 great solo fantasy games, it's now a list of 15 great solo fantasy games with Tainted Grail added on with the others. And, and to be fair, while Tainted Grail has certainly gained a ton of acclaim, mm -hmm. it also came out in 2019. <laughs> yeah. So just pre-pandemic, so there's probably a lot of people out there who haven't yet had True. the experience of Tainted Grail. Um, so it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means it's not out there as much as it may, uh, should be. Now, finally, Gene Chu says, this is a nice list. Interesting comments about sword and sorcery and its comparison to Gloomhaven. Mm -hmm. I thought the AI in sword and sorcery was pretty complex and fiddly compared to Gloomhaven. You have to check a bunch of different conditions depending on the abilities of the enemies. The Gloomhaven AI seemed simpler to me, but I only played Gloomhaven twice. Maybe I just haven't seen more complex enemies. In Swords and Sorcery, the easiest enemies still have some variety in abilities that make fighting each a different experience, and you have to check different things. All right, a few things on this one. Um, potentially fair point. I will admit, straight up, I have not played Swords and Sorcery, but I did do some research into this after Gene's comment. And I have a feeling if you played Gloomhaven only twice, you messed up something in the AI. Because that AI is not anything but simple. The problem is, in the 45-page rulebook that comes with the game, it sounds simple. Plus, a lot of people make assumptions based on other games they played and role-playing games. Like, if you open the door and someone stands there, the monster should all move up and attack that person. But if that person turns invisible... They now can't see the people in the hallway behind them, so don't move. Plus, almost everyone I've seen that plays that game will always march the enemies up, even if there's no actual path to reach someone. And that's actually what you need to find focus. The focus rules in Gloomhaven, honestly, are kind of terrible. And then the line of sight rules are even weirder. And then there's all the rules for if a monster moves into a trap or not. And I honestly think people who think the AI is simple in Gloomhaven are probably making mistakes with it. There is how many pages of Gloomhaven FAQ out there now? We covered it, I don't even know, what, three years ago now? More, I don't even remember more, when we did it was that. more than that. All right, so it's three, just... four years ago, we covered all of the FAQ, and I'm sure it's only grown since then. Now, what I did was compare it, the errata FAQ for Gloomhaven's longer than Swords and Sorcery, plus the number of comments on board games, number of questions, and the rule section was shorter. Now, that could just be because Gloomhaven's more popular. So more people played it, so there's more questions. But I honestly think you're not going to beat the complexity of Gloomhaven, even though it doesn't appear to be there. Yeah, that AI is terrible. Like, there's a flowchart that comes in the game, and even then you're going to mess it up. And the only reason we even found out is because we live-streamed it, and people were catching us making mistakes in the chat room, or else we wouldn't even be aware with half the problems we made. Live streaming Gloomhaven is fantastic because there are so many rules lawyers out there who are happy to jump in and help. Uh, and, and and as long as you're just sort of paying attention to their tone and understand that they are trying to help you, they aren't mm -hmm. actually bashing you down and you can have a better game as a result. What was the name of the one person who was always there? Oh, they were like our, our rule in the lawyer. Chair. Our, 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 we just called our guy in the chair. Yeah, our guy in the yeah. chair. Oh, that shows how long ago it's been since we've yeah. done a Gloomhaven long stream. They were awesome. Oh, absolutely. Like they, they would catch every little they thing. Knew every, they knew the they knew that that rule book inside and out. I, I swear they played every scenario multiple times. <laughs> 
All right. Well, next up, a couple of comments on our talk about adventure games for kids, for younger kids. Uh, Back to the Table says, solid list. Uh, the Inn of Planar Crossroads says, I'm using Open Legend RPG for teaching some homeschooling classes to build math and problem solving, sc- problem solving skills. If anyone's interested in how I'm doing it, I'm posting some videos on my channel around developing those adventures. So first off, thanks for the questions or questions. <laughs> thanks for the comments. Uh, second, I will throw a link to In of the Planar Crossroads uh, in the show notes, which you can find down below, assuming you're watching this once it's somewhere you can watch it and not live. Um, I did dig into looking at Open Legend. So as soon as I saw Legend, I own a game called Legend, the role-playing game. And it is basic role-playing from Chaosium. And it was in the middle when they lost the Roombound license before they got it back and they didn't have the Glorantha license. They needed to, they wanted to keep putting out a fantasy game. So they released this version called legend, which I think was basic role-playing fifth edition. And my basic role-playing is as far away as possible from what I would introduce kids to for role-playing game. So I looked it up and I looked up open legend RPG and I'm like, okay, this is something completely different. This is a, a fairly rules light system. And the reason it's called open legend is open source. So it's completely free and people are adding their own content to it. And it actually looks really solid. So I'm also going to throw a link in for that. Now, I don't know if I can go enough to recommend this one, so I'm not going to go like edit the article to throw this one in there. But I do think Open Legend is a good RPG choice if you're trying to introduce new players, especially younger kids. Where I don't think it'll work is the actual topic was for six-year-olds. This seems a little complicated for six-year-olds, but again, it depends on your kid. Fair enough. Well, that's it for this week's comments. And Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we get on to our main topic tonight. I'm pleased to announce we've entered into an affiliate partnership with Meeple Design. Now, Meeple Design is a company that makes swag for board gamers. Now, they originally started on Board Game Geek by producing really cool looking abstract posters based on board game art to the fact that many publishers reached out to them and they made officially licensed posters based on board game art. And some were really cool. Well, they went from there, then kept creating their own work as well as expanding what you could get. So they now have mugs and t-shirts as well as these posters. Uh, One of the coolest things they have that I'm so tempted to get is they have a Zool throw pillows. And I'm like, oh, I kind of need those for the game. (laughs) Now, fair warning, this place is in the UK, but they do ship worldwide. When you use our special code, Tabletop Bellhop, one word, you get 15% off site wide with the exception of dice and dice accessories. This code is good until April 10th. And hopefully we get some sales before April 10th. So you're going to be like, why are we working with you guys? What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a quick link and drop that in the chat. Sorry, I didn't have it in the notes. We will do this quickly. Where'd my notes go? My notes went missing. Oh, I don't want the notes. I need I need Twitch. Sorry. I, da, da, da. Hey, we might have some edits for the podcast, though. I don't think this is all that terrible. There is a link. Nice and easy. It's just meepledesign.com. And then if you put uh, question mark ref equals bellhop, then we get our affiliate. But if you use our affiliate code, that also works. So either way. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from one of our Patreon patrons, Math Guy Dave, who asks, what are your thoughts on using a tile laying game to start an RPG? Would Land vs. Sea work for this? Oh, thanks so much for the question, Math Guy Dave, and of course for supporting us on Patreon, which you can also do at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Um, I got to say, this came up on our personal Discord channel, which everyone who joins our Patreon gets access to, and... I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was a really cool idea. So at the time, we were talking about our Land vs. Sea review, which is an awesome board game from Good Games Publishing, two to four player tile laying game, where you're basically building a map. And your tiles are made up of either half, well, land and sea in different, either one, one fifth to, to two fifth, I don't even know, one fifth to four fifths of one category and the other, whatever. There's, there's, Divided up into land of land and sea. Yes, <laughs> a mix of land and sea. They're hex tiles. And like, there's always, there's no tile that's all land, all sea. Well, there is, never mind. Watch our review for land versus sea. They're Read tiles. our review on the blog. They're hexes. They have land and sea on them. Yes. 
And the entire game is about playing these where the land player gets points for placing land or completing land sections and the sea player gets points for completing sea sections with lots of other bonus points. Um, that part doesn't really matter. What matters is when you finish this game, you end up with a really cool looking map. And honestly, to answer straight up Dave's question, I don't see why not. I don't see why you couldn't play a game of land versus sea and that become your world. And I actually think if you that'd be an awesome world building uh, like thing, it's a activity to do, right? Like a, a session minus one or maybe just after session zero, 0 0.5, right? You've all sat down, you did your cats, you've talked safety tools, you decide what you're playing. Everyone's got an enthusiastic consent. Then you all get together next week and you play land versus sea. Now, if you got like a six player group, you might want to modify the rules. So it's, you're not playing by the full rules of the game because Though I personally would be really tempted with a group of four to play with the rules and give the players who won some kind of advantage, whether it's a narrative control or they get to pick where their home base is or something. That's what I'd be willing to do. Absolutely. And 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 there's certainly a plenty of games out there that use this sort of map game mechanic. Uh Catan, of course, being one that mm -hmm. I think everyone is is going to be familiar with. Uh, but even games like Carcassonne could be yeah. you know building out uh, a, an area they wouldn't be the full world, world map but they would no. be a region uh and anytime you're putting down uh tiles of some sort with land masses on them even king domino queen domino you know you've yep. got ways to build out your maps uh varying in size from worlds to cities to you know regions even like going in we're talking role playing is not necessarily fantasy but even like twilight imperium there's no reason you couldn't set up your game with Twilight Imperium and then use that as your map. Though, again, uh, I'm going to recommend Eclipse over Twilight Imperium because Twilight Imperium, the map set at the beginning of the game, and it's always the same size. It's always whatever, four or five rings of hexes, whereas Eclipse, while you're playing, you actually expand out and go different ways and you end up putting warp portals and stuff on. So I would strongly recommend, actually, if you were going to play a game of Traveler or something and you don't want to play in the established universe, because I know every square inch of traveler has been mapped because I've seen the maps on Google maps and stuff like that. But if you, if you want to play traveler in your own world, it would be an awesome way to do it. Or even star Wars is to sit there and do it out and then just rename the planet. So they're star Wars planets. I mean, you could even do something if you were playing an open sandbox type sci-fi game, mm -hmm. uh, Zaya would work. Yeah, Zaya legend of a drift system. <laughs> Zaya legend of your drift system could be your entire pre-campaign what happened because that game is all about exploring the galaxy playing a, a a spacer and doing whatever the heck you want that would be it. like playing a game of zaya could be a really interesting way to create your like character backstory or even your setting backstory for where everything is and like oh do you remember in bc 2832 when the cops catch the freighter who was going across the way and he almost got through and tried to get into the planet but crashed into the planetary shield and I could totally see it in Zaya. I hadn't even considered Zaya. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like you could probably play Zaya and make it a role playing game too. Yeah, more than likely. Just, yeah, you know, just, yeah. <laughs> just start role playing between, while you play between Zaya. turns. Just role play out the 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 <laughs> sort of uh, extra bits outside the game. Yeah, definitely for map making. Um, and and similarly, without there's no reason you can't take and use board game maps and role playing games. This is something I have done for years. Whether that's you take your zoom haven scenario book and use the dungeons in there in a fantasy game or just using the tiles to make your own i have stolen gloomhaven map tiles i have stolen boards from games i use the um the star map for the very short-lived i'm trying to forget uh, the battleship sci-fi version oh what is it called it's battleship galaxies Battleship Galaxies is a really good version of Battleship that was about um, fleet battles that sadly only would have worked if they kept putting out expansion. So it kind of died on the vine. But it has a hex map. And what they did is they put a bit of white space around each hex. And what that's great for is all those like Starfleet battleships and that that don't actually fit in hexes next to each other. It gives you enough room to fit stuff. And so we use those with the um, pre-painted Star Wars miniature game figures with those because the ships kind of over go a little big so like i steal that map stealing maps from board games is something i have definitely done what i haven't done though is i've always done it with a tactical game so i have taken a tactical grid or a tactical map or a tactical hick maps map and then use that in a role-playing game what i've not done is say 
taken the map from Mombasa and used that to be a map of Africa in a game or something like that. I'm trying to think of examples. Or using the map for, say, um, Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror or any of those adventure-style games and used it. Or we've talked on the show many times about um, Android Netrunner, but net, just Android, the board game, and how it's got this very Philip K. Dick sci-fi world with a space elevator and everything like that. I could totally see just going, here's our setting for a role-playing game, and then using the standees to show where everyone is and not playing the board game. So again, I think that's a board game you could play to establish your backstory for a role-playing game. No, absolutely. And I mean, there's also some sort of... Uh games out there that already kind of uh sort of cross the line i'm looking behind you and i see man of war and there is yep. the warhammer our uh uh battles rpg or a board game um but sorry, which i don't see behind you right now but the 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 one with that was the world of warhammer where you used to, between mighty empires mighty empires yeah which was yeah. a board game that literally is what we were talking about <laughs> yeah. that way the games workshop got this idea yeah, yeah absolutely. Is, is, is let's play a board game to give us a background for playing warhammer fantasy battle right definitely that um the other thing of course you can do is steal bits right steal things from board games to use in a role-playing games i kind of mentioned this above um in the comments section that whenever I play anything with dungeon tiles, I steal liberally from every other dungeon game I own. And I'm using D&D pre-painted miniatures from when it was a skirmish game. And I'm using uh, Gloomhaven treasure tiles. And I'm using Hero Quest scenery from the original version and now the new version with even more scenery. And I'm using stuff from Mage Knight dungeons for treasure chests because they're nice in 3D. And I'm using overlays that came in a Pathfinder comic book that showed you like a beach scene, you know, like, and it all just ends up together on my table. When I run Star Trek or Star Wars games, whenever I use Star Wars games, my ships come from X-Wing, Star Wars X-Wing from Fantasy Flight. And then my character models come from Star Wars Imperial Assault. I'm just literally taking the miniatures out of one game and using them in another one. And in the Kickstarter driven mini game, heavy mm. world we live in right now, there's no reason why if you have backed some of these mini heavy Kickstarter games, you don't have a whole world of minis to pull from mm -hmm. for your bad guys, your good guys, your NPCs, your characters, whatever. Uh, there's so much miniature content out there right oh, yeah. now. I mean, we are in a world I never could have imagined back when I was oh, yeah. thinking about collecting miniatures and, and back in the days with you know early Warhammer uh, armies that you know everyone was creating their own everything and now mm -hmm. i mean it's just a glut if you want it it's out there and the, one of the big ones you're mentioning the the what we used to have them to make it all our own scenery like back in the day scenery was intensive difficult work although i enjoyed it now i can get any pretty much any scenery i want 3d printed by someone at a very reasonable price let alone mm -hmm. the number of companies that do paper and 3d scenery like fat dragon games came out of from doing paper scenery that was flat on a map to 3d scenery to fold flat 3d scenery which i love because then you can put it away to now they are one of the biggest companies in fantasy 3d printed stl files they're the ones that invented the dragon lock system that's now open source and everyone uses to attach all those together. That comes all from Fat Dragon. And I'm like, I watched this company grow from, you know, bad, like, oh, bad 2D maps to like 3D dungeons to like amazing 3D printed stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, when we started, our scenery was the sort of the leftover bits and pieces from railroad, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all the all the hobby railroad people. That was yes. that was where a lot of the battle scenery st uh, started from was hobby railroad uh scenery because that's so, what there was so much lichen on all of my game <laughs> tables so much lichen so much lichen. and then little yep. plastic trees yep. with lichen tops yep we had tons of it and well heck when we used to play warhammer we used cardboard the hills were cardboard cut out rings to show elevations right absolutely of course that was also back when you keep the book came with an army in the back that you cut out of the back of the book and you use chits so things have definitely changed that way as well indeed um let me think what else we got what other uh, ways well, we can use board games so so like just some interesting ones like way out there right I, th I think the big thing here is be creative think outside the box i'm just saying i want to play a sci-fi game which starts with me playing a game of galaxy trucker 
and then using the awards. So at the end, I can like have those as badges of honor on my character and then go, okay, I've now made enough money to buy my first ship. And now you start your traveler campaign or you start your white star campaign or whatever sci-fi thing. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I used to haul pipes because that's literally in Galaxy Trucker. You're moving sanitary pipes. That's the backstory for Battle Studio. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I used to haul pipes. Now I uh, now I'm doing this. We're, we're saving the galaxy. So I want to go I want to I want to go in the other direction. So you're talking yeah. about let's take this Galaxy Trucker and we'll make it into an RPG. When I started out. I would raid the board games for dice because I didn't have dice. I wasn't an RPGer, True. and at the time, now granted, it's a lot easier to get dice than it ever was back then. Back then, but there's no reason that if you need a few D6 to go roll up a and d character, you can't just go steal them from your family's copy of Payday and Monopoly until yep. you can buy your own set. You know, there's no reason you can't reuse all those components. So well, nowadays, you could probably get a full D and D set from a relatively reasonably sized board game collection yeah, absolutely uh like you just you get your d4s from kemet you get your d6s from everywhere you get your d8s from i don't know I, now now i'm telling that <laughs> best games to steal dice from could be a topic that, that might be a put a pin in it for later uh another one is cash right uh, we're not we're not going to talk about the evils of paper money but there are so many board games out there now with great monetary in the you know whether it be chip whether it be clays or metal or whatever you have you mm -hmm. there's a great way to have piles of cash in you because there are some times where you don't want to be you want to be ma managing the economy in a game in an rpg but you don't want to be writing down and scratching out numbers constantly so just keep yeah. a little pile of gold in front of your character sheet it's a really easy way to do it and often makes more sense than writing down the number of gold and silver on your character sheet which leads me to props grab miniatures from another game or a weird board game component or little pieces of gold or whatever and use them for your characters find this and you're like what the heck is that i'm like oh it's the first player token from dinosaur island you know what what the heck is this thing it's actually a slap bracelet so i'm thinking cyberpunk game at that point but whatever <laughs> what i want to know though before we before we kind of rambling a bit getting back to math guy dave's questions can you think of games to start a role-playing game where you would play the board game and then go from there to playing a role-playing game. I mean, honestly, it, it really depends on the role-playing game. I mean, if you really wanted to do something and you were looking for a modern RPG where you were going to be, you know, playing in, a, in, a, in modern day cities and there was a strong, you could make Monopoly work. You know, you could that's, each start that's a off. Rough. You can Who each, owns each yeah, street? You've there got, you, go. you know, the, your your relative wealth and you know how much uh, income you've got. You could make it work. I probably wouldn't play the full game because, again, it's Monopoly. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, just a way to establish levels of uh, economic wealth between characters. You could make Monopoly work. Uh, the game how you of determine life. Your starting money. The game of life. Uh, you know who ends up uh, better off on the path. I mean, look, Traveler and the Game of Life. Their character creation paths aren't that different. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when I give Sean no script. We we get. I'm waiting for the how you tie Candyland into a role playing game. I'm not gonna push that. I'm not gonna go that far. <laughs> not, I'm not going that, go that far. far. Uh, but there's so it's here's there, one I right? thought of. Lot of so um, here's one I thought. Tom Vassell's game, nothing personal, is all about reestablishing dominance in a mob, right? Mm -hmm. And you literally end up building by the end of the game uh, a, a hierarchy, a mob hierarchy. And it's all about getting your people up into the boss and like trying to be, you know, you get points for how, how high up your people are. It would be really cool to play a game of that and then that make that the mob in your game, whether, whether you're mob members or you're the cops trying to crack them, whatever, but just a way to establish the mob hierarchy. You end up with images of every NPC or player. Again, you could go either way. I think that would be really cool. In similar fantasy, there is a board game called Oh, I'm going to forget the name. Warband Against the Darkness. There it is. That is a game where you are trying to build the best warband of fantasy monsters to take out the good guys who are off board. And it's all about vying for power and trying to become the warband leader and controlling more units than your opponents. And again, that seems like a really cool way that like, you know, we're going to get together next weekend. Instead of role playing, we're going to play Warband Against the Darkness. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, Dave's not going to make it, so we're just going to play this. All right. And then the next session, the the DM comes in, and you're like, oh, you see the fires of Rohan lit. You're like, what? Someone is invading, and it ends up being the warband. I just think that would be really cool. 
No, absolutely. Uh, and I mean, you know, you could. Uh, uh, there's so many, so many options. Look at, I mean, look at Gloomhaven. You're building a city, and once your once your city's the done and everything, oh, yeah, you've you've got your own custom city to to play with in your RPG that no one else will have the same city uh, in theory. Yeah, pretty much any of those games, right? Like Pandemic. Play a game in a Pandemic Legacy. I would probably play Legacy for this. If you played through Pandemic Legacy, set your next zombie apocalypse game on that map, on that board, with what happened. You know, uh, you'd have to play the game to know what happened. <laughs> or, or similarly, we're playing through Charterstone right now, where you just finished game eight, and playing through Charterstone using that charter, your six different charters as, here's your fantasy city. Here's the shops that are there. Yes, you can go there to buy cat familiars. And yeah, that old iron mine over there is haunted by ghosts. But if you give them a donation, the ghost will follow and help you out. Like you could totally do a fantasy city out of a Charterstone game. So I do get to ask, why, is Isaac going to do a role-playing game? Because he should. Like he has a fantastic world in Gloomhaven. So it's, a, it's a, even more grim dark than Warhammer. That is a, a disturbing world. But the fact that he didn't go with standard orcs dwell, dwarf, 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 we're just going to mash all those fantasy races <laughs> together. Orcs, dwarves, and elves is what I was trying to say. You know, he's got all his inox and his, um, I can't even remember all the races in that game, the 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 vermlings, which, yeah, okay, they're a little scaven-like, but he's got the, the weird bee-like people. I don't even remember what they're called. Quatrils, that's it. He came up with a totally new world, and it just feels like it's being underused. Right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, he's putting out enough games of it. So, I mean, you still got to get uh, the ice one out of the way. And uh... plus that rule book. Come on. That, that is basically a role playing <laughs> game rule book. He's halfway there. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what else have we got? I mean, there's there's talk. You could you you could you look at also use games like magic as your magical system, magic system. I, uh, I, there were back in the day people who tried this yeah no absolutely there were definitely i remember people trying this at the windsor gaming society and i mean and you, speaking of that i got so ripped off on magic because that's how it was sold to me someone was like this is dungeons and dragons played with a deck of cards you're playing a wizard and these are all your spells and you're doing this but like totally sold it as a role-playing game I read the rules. I'm like, this isn't a fucking role playing. There's no role playing here at all. The only role playing is making fun of my opponent if I win. Like, <laughs> there's no role playing here. So shame on you, whatever game store you were called in Livonia, Michigan, that <laughs> sold me those. I can picture where it was. I don't remember what it was called. Place I bought all my TSR Marvel stuff when I got back into it. So now I, I realize we're flipping the question around completely. Unless you got more. Um, can you think of any role-playing games that would lead you into a board game? Uh, role playing. The only thing I can think of is playing as your characters in a board game. Like yeah. if you're playing D and D, you somehow create your D and D characters in Gloomhaven. Yep. Right. Like you just pick the the character class that's closest to whatever you play in D and D, or you know you're playing Imperial Assault and you're playing Star Wars. You're going to pick a character. You know you're going to play the Jedi or the Smuggler or whatever. I could see that. But I can't think of many that would really enhance the board game experience. Yeah, I mean, um, no, nothing really comes to mind because the problem the problem you run into, of course, is that there's so much more detail in an RPG character that yeah. is stripped away when you go into a board game. I mean, you could take your characters and, uh, you know, Dyson in the chat room already mentioned uh, playing D&D &D in the Cluedo Mansion. Well, you could yep. play, you could take your characters and play Clue, but to play Clue, you would have to strip out so much of what your character is or add so much more into the game of Clue. Right. Uh, you've you've got to, one way or the other, um, there's there's no sort of uh, easy way to to merge those together. All right. We're going we're gonna to segue to something that's not even happening next. I honestly think you could do it with Tales from the Loop that we're going to review later today because the characters have all the stats. I think you might be able to play your Tales from the Loop, the role-playing game character in the Tales from the Loop board game without any modification. You might have to pick a different special item from the deck. Like you'd be limited, even then you might be able to make up your own version, but that takes a little bit more creativity. But I would think you could go through that item deck and pick the thing that's closest to your personal item. There's enough range there. It's got the same six stats, only two matter. So you're going to pick your highest stat and your lowest. Right. I no, honestly think that might work. That's fair. That's that's absolutely fair because again, that is a direct translation. Yes. Unlike something like where Clue, a Clue in D and D, where where the characters are completely 
you know, developed in one side and just a name and a picture on the other side. Uh, these in, in Tales from the Loop, the character is the character. Yes, you've yeah. eliminated a couple of stats, but the, the meat of it is all still there. Right? I, I honestly think it'll work, which is what made me think think about this, if there were any others. Now, what I do wonder is there is Clue Dungeons & Dragons that came out when 3.0 was released. I wonder if that has anything actually tied to D&D besides a bunch of D&D-themed rooms and items. Right. Now, one of the things I know people have played Dungeon, the, the classic dungeon with an exclamation point TSR game with their D&D characters, but they had to play Dungeon, and I feel sorry for them because Dungeon is not a very good game. And there's another game where I stole the map. I have totally used the Dungeon map in a D&D game, completely used it. Now, where you get into more of this overlap would be as if you use Dungeon to generate your random encounters for a role-playing game. And that could be kind of cool. I, I honestly don't know if it worked from what I remember of Dungeon is you end up finding like Beholders right at the beginning, which would be terrible for first level characters. Though if you're playing old school, I guess it's all part of the game and you run away. But I don't remember a lot of, you know, kobolds and goblins in the decks for Dungeon. Though I do remember there were different decks at different levels. So, mm. but yeah, no reason not to do what they've asked, right? Uh, using a tile aid game to start an RPG, why not? Use Carcassonne to, to build your, your countryside, especially like something like Cart. You're getting you're getting cities, you're getting farms, you're getting those wayside inns if you've got the inns and cathedrals expansion. You're getting the chapels, like you're you're actually getting quite a bit of your standard tropes of fan of fantasy right there out of a game of cart. Um the idea of using a game to set up your economy is fascinating. Um, if it, we're gonna bring up an obscure one that I reviewed a while ago, Shafosa. Shafosa is a fantasy economic game. You could totally play a game of Shafosa, and then you got a couple things that happen with that. For one, you end up with a map of all these different kingdoms that you could use that show like how many different types of resource production buildings they have. Plus, you could set the starting economy in your game, and you could look at it and go, you know what? Gold was worth nothing by the end because everyone had it, but wood is really rare in this world. And I could totally see playing a game of Shafosa to do it, but again, you got to play a game of Shafosa, and that's not one of the most popular games out there. But if you're into that type of um, economic for similitude. If you're looking for a simulationist game, if you want to do GURPS fantasy, you might want to play Shafosa first. Here's one. Uh, if, as a as a sort of uh, interesting, is it even technically playing a board game in the middle of an RPG? But if you're playing uh, Aliens or something of that nature, uh, and it's time to fight in the ship, do you break out a copy of Space Hulk and just play a board mm -hmm. game? Because uh, I mean, or, there's no reason. Nemesis. There's no reason you can't RPG your characters, uh, and on top of that, um, you know, there's it's and it's just a matter of you know the the game is is there to really play out your strategies. Um, and here's now what, what I've what I found with that is is it doesn't actually work because as soon as someone fails in the game, like well, my character would have been better. Like, especially Space Hulk, right? It's these six rolls, and you only hit on a six. And then if you shoot multiple shots, then you hit on a five, a four, a three, a two, a one. And like They'd be like, no, I have a 98 weapon skill. There's no way. I That's what's happened any time I've tried that. So I've specifically done it with the Warhammer games. What I would totally do, though, is break out Space Hulk for the map and minis. Right. And the blips. Like, the blip system, I would totally use all that, but then I'd still stick to RPG rules. Like your character would still have all your character abilities and their weapons, and they'd be rolling whatever dice the role playing system uses, not the dice from Space Hulk. Right. And so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of drift a little bit here. We're on similar topics, but uh, and and this is and, and I know I'm 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 taking a, I'm, I'm definitely taking a, a crack at you on this one, but mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, 4E was a board game, yep. not an RPG. Uh, so you know when does a game become an RPG versus a board game is Gloomhaven an RPG. It's not a board game already. You know, there, you, there you are asked. people that will argue it. The, the, my whole thing in any of those is um, trying to think of a, a, a polite, <laughs> we're not explicit <laughs> yet way to say it, but um, can I go lick the door and then, I don't know, slap the guard in the face with a fish and then go to the washroom in the corner in the board game. And if I can't, then it's not a role playing game. So the question I have for, for that, exactly that is, you can, but there's no rules that 
mechanically throw anything. So go ahead and say you do it. And and you walk over to the corner and you say you take a leak. Fine, you're wasting your turn because there's no taking a leak has no mechanical uh, equivalent in the game other than wasting time, basically. So uh, sure. It depends on the game. If you have to walk across the room, it might take movement points. Like, it really depends on the game. Well, I know, absolutely. But, but, but it's, it's the whole example. free will thing. Can, yeah. can I, instead of completing the adventure and doing the thing, instead we betray the king and we keep the money? Like all of that. Like it's all stuff that, depending on the board game you're playing, there, there's certain things. Like I'm going to play Monopoly, but you know what? I'm going to, I want to half the rent on all my buildings. Right. And like, there's no rule for I'm going to charge less rent for this place. Or if this person lands here, I'm not going to charge them. I'm like, you're going to get some really upset people playing Monopoly if you start playing that way. It's it's the free will. Board games, the whole thing is is board games are, um, I'm going to forget the two terms. Jeff Seuss explained this well. He used better terms than I did. But like, basically, board games tell you what you can't do, where role-playing games tell you what you can do. Or sorry, the other way around. Role-playing games tell you what you can't do, because there are some limitations Whereas board games are very structured and here are the only things you can do. Right. I, again, I'm wording it wrong, but like, that's the difference is, is one, one. And, and while there's the whole, you win, you lose thing. It's interesting. Cause like one of the, you know, I, I was, I was reading up a little bit on this and just sort of getting some, getting some people's takes on it. And one person's was, Oh, it's a board game. Or uh, it's a, it's an RPG. If the monsters can open the door before you. And I'm like, and, and, and the response is space Hulk. They can. Yeah, in some games they can. <laughs> in yeah. some games they can. Uh, but again, then that's and that's just sort of again, you know, what but is yeah, yeah, a better will... example is I convinced the monster to join our side. Right. There, the, I don't. I can't think of a single dungeon crawling board game I've ever played where I can do that. Right. And where, but I mean, at I the can same go in time, and talk. I, I want to sneak past the guards instead of attacking them. I, yeah. Again, no. Sneak, see, sneak to me, crawl. sneaking is a better is a better example. Yeah, because there's no there's a lot of fantasy monsters or a lot of fantasy GMs who would say, "Well, you can't talk to them; they're a monster. You can't you can't convince them to do anything uh, right or wrong." I'm not disagreeing. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not supporting that argument. But there's a lot of GMs out there who will go with the whole "you can't convince an alien creature to like you." Um, Maybe aliens, but yeah. I, we're not going to get into the orcs are evil no argument because that's kind of where that goes nope, but absolutely. like sneak whatever you know what i mean though is is the whole i i bake him a pie and i i feed the dog i i feed the hellhound i throw him a piece of meat like any of that right that's the kind of stuff that like i've yet to see a board game that en that encompasses the ability to do all of that right without just saying no you can't do that because well that's what board games are about is they're we'll get a whole book that tells you what you can do and if it's not in there you can't do it Whereas a role-playing game goes, here's what you can't do. Other than that, go wild. Right. And here's the the basic rule you use whenever you come up with something that's not in here. Yep. All right. Um... All right. We kind of went off on a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> um, I'm going to remove the battery from before it blows up. Additional mapping games. I'm trying to think of uh, what are there. I, uh, I was just trying to think. There's got to be. Like I've definitely swapped role-playing games. Like I've been running. I've I've run a game of Warhammer where there was a point where the players were about to attack a pirate ship and it was going to be this super high action combat. And we actually switched over to Feng Shui from Robin Laws just to play out that combat and then switch back to role play Warhammer when we got back into the intrigue and everything. It worked great. It was awesome. Like that's an example, but that's a role playing game to a role playing game. Right now, another thing that I, here's something I hadn't mentioned. I forgot about playing a board game in the middle of a role playing game. I've done it. They exist. Wizards of the coast has put out, at least three different card games that are meant to be played in the middle of a D&D section, session. Like your characters go to the Green Dragon Inn, you sit down and you get into a rousing game of Three Dragon Ante. And then the DM grabs it and throws Three Dragon Ante down on the table and you all shuffle and play Three Dragon Ante and you're playing for your character's real gold or whatever. And there are multiple games. Great Dal Moody is the latest version they put out, but there's another one that I'm trying to, uh, Fistful of Dragon Stones is another one. Uh, Three Dragon Ante is the one that I remember even had rules for D and D in it, where like if your character stats were higher, you could do something with your hand. That was really integrated, so I always thought that was fascinating. Now I know it's not quite what Dave's talking about, but it is definitely an overlap. Now what I've never done is been in the middle of a board game saying, "No, wait, we got to roll up characters and play through this encounter." Like I don't know, you're playing Zaya and you're both fighting over the planet, and you decide, "Oh no, that's it. We need to see what really happened in this battle," and then you go play a role playing game. I guess it could happen. I think the closest would be that Mighty Empires, where, you know, you're playing out 
abstract on an overland map. And when the battles happen, you play Warhammer Fantasy Battle. But again, that's not playing a role-playing game. That's playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Right. Um, I think what else we got? Uh, Delve is a dungeon dungeon building game that could possibly get be used for uh, building out your dungeon maps in advance. Um, playing... I could totally see like building an adventure playing by playing a board game yep. or porting one. Like the, I, I, there's no reason if you own a copy of Imperial Assault, you couldn't totally go through the campaign book and kind of port some of that into your Edge of Empire game. You're already gonna have the maps and the minis. They give you a good setup on what's happening and why these things are happening. Um, then there's also like the, there's the in between games too. The game specifically made to set up a role playing game. So Kingdom, Microscope, and I know there are others out there. Yeah, uh, we've talked about using For the Queen. I don't really consider those board games. I consider those pure RPGs. But then people are like, well, they're not RPGs because you're just world building. And I'm like, they're not really board games either, right? That's why I call them the in between games. Um, also city building and a lot of powered by the apocalypse style games would also be similar to this but it, oh here's one i hadn't thought of is i don't know where it stands now so phil vecchion dna phil's hydro hacker operatives h2o role-playing game his hydro hack at one time was a card game um oddly based on the card game guillotine and it was all about how much water you were allowed to hack and he had it as purely narrative powered by the apocalypse and felt it didn't feel like enough like a hack then he had it pure board game and he felt it was too much and then he kind of settled on this card game but he still felt like you were playing a different game like he said if i ever do it in the role-playing game i i I have a cliffhanger so we end on the hack and then we play the hack out with the people involved in the hack and then we resume the role-playing game another week so that because it feels so disconnected but that was an example where you would literally stop role playing, played a board game, then went back to role playing based on, and things changed based on the results of the board game. But it was a very proprietary, fill only kind of thing. Right. Uh, another map game. Well, talking, you know, talking earlier about tile place and games, and, and back to the original, you know, build use a map to build uh, a world. Uh, Cusco, or which is a reimplementation of Java not only builds the map but it actually builds levels so you're actually Mm. building up stacking tiles to build mountainous terrain on top of laying out your lakes and your and your valleys and everything else um so that's kuzco or uh which is a re-implementation of java not when i played all right i think we probably kind of not beating this into the ground but kind of ran around in circles enough time that i'm feeling a little, little dizzy unless you got something else to throw in there uh summarize yes <laughs> play a board game use the use the results in your role-playing game heck have your character play play your game of Catan in character and then start up on the end and use what happened in your game of Catan as backstory like you remember when your empire built that road across my path and stopped us from getting into the forest Go for it, do it, and then tell us about it. In the comments below, send me an email, mo at tabletopbellop.com. I, w- I want to hear about it if you do that, especially if you use Sean's Monopoly or uh, <laughs> Game of Life Life Pass system. If you, yeah, you can use basic Hasbro family night games as part of your RPG experience, yeah. let us know. I, I want to use Game of Life for like the startup of like a Dresden Files game. Or, or or um changeling the dreaming right something where there's like the veil right like it's just it's your normal world here's your normal life and at this point that's when you found out fairies are real there we go well that's it for our thoughts on using board games along with rpgs now we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions if you got a question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com Welcome to our review from the Tales from the Loop board game from Free League oh, Publishing. Who we have to thank for sending us a review copy. All right, Tales from the Loop, the board game, was designed by Rickard and Troya and Martin Takichi and features artwork from Rain Rosenberg and, of course, Steinman Stallenhog, who is responsible for creating the entire Tales from the Loop thing through his fantastic art books. Now, this cooperative board game plays one to five players with games taking anywhere from an hour and a half to 
three to four hours, depending on the player count and which scenario you choose to play. Now, this very full and heavy box has an MSRP of $56.99 US. One note, we are reviewing the retail version of this game, not the Kickstarter version that came with additional miniatures and scenarios. All right, so in Tales from the Loop, you are playing kids in an 80s that never was in an area of Sweden where they built the Loop, a large hadron collider, and weird stuff is happening. You're going to pick a scenario to play and then solve the mystery of that scenario using mechanics that will be familiar from anyone who's a fan of the Tales from the Loop role-playing game, also from Free League Publishing. Now, for a uh, look, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, you get to check out the components of the game, which I've got to say are pretty much top notch. I, I have zero complaints about the components in this game whatsoever. You got some really cool looking miniatures. You got standees for the, the characters, which works. You've got a really um, vibrant, clear looking board. So I will admit the the grid on it is a little too light. So, so one little minor flaw with the board, the grid's a little too light. You have a ridiculous number of cards, a bunch of tokens, You've got a set of Tales from the Loop dice. These are custom D6 dice, where the six has the symbol of Reeks Energy, the company that owns the loop on them. These are the exact same dice that are used for the role-playing game. So bonus, if you play the role-playing game, you get a bonus set of dice in this. Or if you already own the role-playing game, you have extra dice you can use with the board game. Um, you got dual layer boards. That's another highlight there. You've got some really nice mechanics for slotting in stuff onto these boards based on the player count. you got cards for the robot just lots of nice stuff everything excellent quality it all punched great and it even comes with a box insert though i will say there's nothing that tells you what goes where so i have no idea if my board game is organized properly but it all fits back in the box and it's kept safe so i'm happy with it and we mentioned in the synopsis that this is a heavy game there's a reason because you really do get a ton of quality material yeah. that makes this a a solid hunk of a yes. board game box <sighs> and and yeah no i the the double the double layer uh boards are really uh a phenomenal aspect of this game I, it mm. would not be the same if you had to worry about knocking cubes for instance especially yes. uh there, there's a lot of little places to to track things on your player boards mm -hmm. and i would hate to try and do that without a double layer board <laughs> totally agree so what exactly are we doing with all these fantastic components? All right. So you're going to, you're going to set everything up, you know, put the board out, pull out all the player boards, all that stuff, get everything kind of out on the table. You're going to pick a scenario to play. There are multiple scenarios included with the game, all of which are replayable. Um, I would go so far as say infinitely replayable, though I will admit knowing what's coming will change the way you play. So there is definitely an experience to be had playing a scenario the first time and a different experience had playing it a second time. What I strongly recommend, and I'm going to say this here instead of later in the review, is play one of the one week scenarios. And I specifically recommend the passenger or the light fantastic as they introduce you better to the game than the other scenarios. No, the rule book will tell you to play bot amok. I strongly don't recommend playing that one. That's actually the most complicated scenario in the entire game. I'm not sure why they recommend it. So you're going to pick a scenario. You're going to take all the cards for that scenario. You're going to use the reference card to kind of get things set up, which involves shuffling some decks and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into the full details here. Then everyone's going to pick a kid to play. So again, you are playing kids. And these are kids from the 80s who, of course, had a lot more freedom than most of the kids nowadays have. Uh, these are the type of kids you expect uh, that you see in movies like E.T. or in the TV show Stranger Things. And though I haven't seen it, I have to assume the Amazon Tales from the Loop series. Um, you've got a bunch of kids with a little less restrictions that you're playing. You're each going to pick one. Each kid is, is identical except for three things. You're going to have a specific stat out of six that you're good at a specific stat out of six you're terrible at, and you're going to have a unique item. This is an item you can use infinite number of times you'll never lose. Other than that, the kids are pretty much the same except for like description and what they look like. Once you've all picked your kids, you're then going to get it set up for based on the number of plays. So your skill levels change based on how many players you're playing. Then you're going to start on the school. Now you're going to start the game. You're going to start off getting a chore. So there's a deck of chores. You're going to shuffle this. Everyone's going to get two and they're going to pick one to use. Now, this is an awesome part of the game where there is stuff you have to get done by Friday in the first week. 
And if you have a second week of play, you're actually going to draw a new chore and have to be done by Thursday. But you have to complete this or else you get penalized. And they include all kinds of things. Like uh, you have to go to hockey practice. You got to mow the lawn. You got to clean your room. You have to return your movies to the video store before they're, they're late and so on. Now you're going to take these chores and then you're going to start your day at school. Now you start a day at school by drawing a school card. Something's going to happen and someone's going to have to roll some dice. This might be the player whose turn it is so they're they're gonna it's gonna in, uh, only be them or it could be the entire group has to roll or one player can roll and the other players are gonna help now i'm gonna explain the roll system really simple you're gonna look at the skill you're gonna look at your number of the skill you're gonna roll that many of the d6 dice and if you get any six you succeed if you fail you have the option to push and you do that by taking one of three complication types again a little more detail than you need for this type of review you take a complication and you can re-roll Again, you're just looking for one six. If you succeed, you get whatever it says good happens. And if you fail, you get whatever penalty. If any other players help, they also are subject to the penalty. And some cards have a different penalty for the helpers than the person making the roll. Uh, there are actually some cards too that don't take place right then. They could affect the day. Yes. Yeah, that is definitely. And some don't actually require a roll. Some just say this is happening. Like the buses aren't running today, which can be really annoying. <laughs> then you start playing. And the interesting thing is at this point, you don't even know what you need to do. None of the scenarios tell you from right at the start what the mystery is or what you need to do to win or what happens to make you lose. You literally have no idea when you play. And this is why that gameplay, the first time you play a scenario is going to be very different from the second time you play a scenario. Now, what you will have is something going on on the board and then a key on a card that tells you what to do. So it might be if you go investigate the robot, flip this card over. Or it might be as soon as you've gotten to insight, flip, draw this card and put it in play. And these are all different besides all the scenario. Now, most of these events are based on two um, resources. I don't know what you'd call those. What would you call the two things at the top? Um, I Trackers. guess, yeah, track this. Basically, it's the two game stats. Like they're the yeah. stats for the actual game, the good and the bad. Yeah, so you're, you're good. Your good is insight, insight into the mystery, right? You're figuring things out. You gain insight by um, like solving problems. Enigma is the bad thing. And that happens when you fail at roles or when certain events happen, like the school gets lit on fire. Slight spoiler, but I'm not telling you where it happens. So it's not going to really give you anything away. Um, so then you can just play like you wander around the board and you start doing stuff. Now, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to fill the board with rumors. Start of the game, there are four rumors on the board, and there's a bunch of locations on the board, all uh, signed by letters. And there are points on these Swedish islands connected by, by it's a path map, right? Some of the restrict or areas are restricted and some are open, which will matter when you're moving. You're going to put out rumors, and one of the main things you're probably going to do at the start of the game is just have to start investigating the local rumors to try to get your insight up. Now, some of the rumors are going to be generic that are in every game. that are It's all part of a deck, and some will be specific to the scenario. The basic rules for insight and enigma are if you solve a rumor effectively that's for the plot, you gain an insight. If you fail any rumor, you gain an enigma. And if rumors are left up too long, if they get pushed off the edge of the board, you gain two enigma, which is actually terrible. Now, there's a whole system for replenishing them, but I'm not going to get into the details of that. But I will say it's based on the player count. So now you're kind of moving around the board and you're going to do the things. And the way you do this is you have six cubes that represent your time. So basically you went to school in the morning, you've got six hours, we'll say abstractly. You've got six hours at the end of the school day to do stuff. You spend cubes to do things like walking. It takes one cube to move to an adjacent spot on the map or two if you go to a restricted area. You can take a bus. There's a line of locations on the map that are connected by a bus. It takes you one cube to move to any of those. You can call your parents for a ride. They will bring you to any open spot on the map, but not the restricted areas. Though note, they will pick you up from the restricted areas to bring you somewhere else. That costs a cube, but can only be done if your parents are happy with you. Because at the top of your character card are, is a spot where you represent if your parents are happy with you, okay with you, or mad at you. If your parents are ever mad at you, you get grounded. Yes, that actually happens in the game, which takes up two of your cubes, and it's terrible. So you have two less hours a day because you've been grounded. Um, the other way you can move is ride a robot that gets into a whole other thing that we'll talk about in a moment. So that's all your different ways to move. You can scout an area in a, your spot or adjacent spot. You can flip over a rumor card to read it, 
or you can see how hard a robot is to hack or often the scenarios have ways to scout things like i found that came up a lot in the different scenarios where like scout the robots that are over here or scout this location three times or something like that so you can scout then you can interact with something that's how you actually try to solve a rumor or it might be something on the card like you need to interact with this robot to get it started again because it's out of power one thing worth testing. noting one thing worth noting is movement uh it's a big bigger map than you think it is yes uh -huh. so getting from point a to point b takes a lot and then it seems like six hours is a lot but uh it takes a long time to get uh between yeah. places on the map all right another thing you can do is hack robots this uses a whole mini game where you're pulling tiles out of a bag and making multiple skill checks uh, it's probably the most complicated part of the rules and definitely not something I'm going to fully cover here. I will just say it's hard um, to go with the robots. They're either alert or not. And hacking an alert robot, I've got to say, is almost impossible. You only want to hack when they're when they're not alert. Um, there's also rules for if you move into a spot with an alert robot, something might happen. There's a whole thing with these robots moving around the boards. They move at the start of the turns. Uh, we're not going to get into the details of that. Um, when you're interacting with a spot and you're making a check, so one of the things I didn't mention before is often the rewards will be you get items. Plus, every character starts with their signature item. One of the coolest things in this game is all of the items can be combined with other items. Now, they can't all be combined with each other, but if you combine the lighter with the spray paint, you can make an explosive. And the way these work in the game is every time you go to make a skill check, it'll tell you how you can automatically succeed. If you have two items that will combine to the right keyword, you don't have to make a die roll. That is one of the neatest things in the system. So if you combine one of the character's bikes with your AV cable, you can tow something and so on. There's all these different combos. When you hack a robot, they give you a full free thing they can do. So the, the Parhoffer robot lets you tow things around if you've hacked that robot. So that's another neat part of the system. Um, you can rest. That's how you remove those conditions. Again, conditions are things that you get you get frustrated, you get exhausted, you can even be hurt and injured. That ends up using up your cubes. Also, if you're stressed out, you can't help other people, and there's a whole bunch of system for that going on as well. Uh, the last action you can do is you can go home in time for dinner. So you are expected to make it home in time for dinner, and if you don't, your parents are going to get upset with you. And again, if they're already in with you, they're going to ground you for not being home on time. So part of the game is making sure you're home on time. And of course, with all this going on, remember, you still have chores you're trying to complete as well, which usually require you to go somewhere and spend cubes. All right, you got all that? Like, like that's, that's still an overview. Like, the, this is a crunchy game with a lot going on. There, there is tons going on. And that's about all I can tell you. Because then there's all the other stuff that comes up when you read the cards. You might be beating up teenagers. You might need to figure out this secret code to join the UFO club. You, you might end up placing new locations on the map where you can actually go to the video store or go to the astronomy center and talk to the astronomer. Like This is a big chunk of a game that is trying to recreate the feel of the role-playing game and get you immersed into this world of playing kids solving mysteries. The, the card decks involved here are remarkable and the amount of, of sort of a and b sides of cards and this card triggers this card which triggers this card which brings out this card and flips this card over to side b uh despite yeah. the fact that this is a board game and it's very in some ways i want to say linear i mean it's on rails yeah. uh the fact that they have got such a wide branching system mm -hmm. for these individual scenarios Really, again, until you've played it a few times, if you choose to play it multiple times in a scenario, you're not going to see it all. There's going to be yeah. other things that, that will happen and can happen in that scenario that you just don't know about. And there was one scenario that had three ways to lose and two ways to win. So even that, even playing the same scenario, you could play it five times and get five different endings. So now that you've got a pretty good idea of how Tales from the Loop plays, let's move on to sharing some of our thoughts about the game. All right, so so first disclosure here. Um, I love Tales from the Loop. I love the setting. I love the role-playing game. I love the art of Simon Stallenhog. I grew up in the 80s. I love that era. I love the Goonies. I love uh, E.T. and I loved Stranger Things. 
this is definitely my childhood we're playing out with. Sean and I spent more times on our bikes than home with our parents. It was just part of our childhood and getting to play that out is really cool. And that alone makes me want this game. Like as soon as I heard this existed, I needed to have a copy. Absolutely. I, the memories and the thoughts uh, the only sort of interesting weirdness of it is that unlike the RPG, which has an, a, a North American and a European setting, this one only has the European setting, the original, uh, the, the original Northern European setting yeah. for the game. So pronunciation of some things becomes a little weird. Uh, but once you're over that, again, there's still a lot of this feel of hopping on your bikes and outrunning the bullies or you know, whatever, you know, returning the video, the VHS tape to the video stores. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe not the robots, but other than that, there's a whole lot of familiarity. Yes. No, I, I have to agree 100%. Though I got to admit, I, I would have liked a two-sided board. Like, like the role-playing game did such a good job in the starter set, which you can read our review of, did such a good job of just having a slash, like two names for everything, that I, I can't imagine the production cost being that much more who have given me Denver on the other side. Though I have to say there was no point when playing, except for trying to pronounce some of the locations on the map, that I felt like I was Sweden or I felt foreign or out of place or wrong. Yeah. It definitely didn't really get in the way of being able to play. No, absolutely. Again, it, it's really just pronunciation because there are a couple of letters or letters with, uh, you know, symbols over top of them that we don't use in, in English. Yes. And you kind of shoot your shot on what it sounds like and, don't play it live. Don't play it on a live stream if you don't want to embarrass yourself <laughs> exactly. with uh, pronunciations in front of the public. So yeah, love Tales from the Loop, and I like the concept of this. Basically, you can tell there was a group that loved the role-playing game or worked on it. I know the designer names don't overlap there, but I, there's got to be something. They're all from Free League. I'm not sure. Someone definitely involved with the role-playing game worked on this, and this is basically trying to give you a GM-less Tales from the Loop experience for good or bad that is definitely the driving here this is very much the same mechanics from the role-playing game ported to a board game i already mentioned above you use the same dice you use the same six skills though all that matters in this is two of your skills you don't have your full set of six and you don't have all the mechanics from like your um i forget what the term is i've read the role-playing game and i played it um, where, where you, you have like a touchstone where you talk, talk to someone to get your, your exhaustion goes away by going to your secret place. All that stuff's kind of gone. It's definitely a high level version. And this leads to some problems because it's trying so hard to be a role playing game that it sometimes fails as a board game because of it. Now, yeah. one of the, go ahead. No, no, no. Now, one of the biggest ways this happens, and, and one, one of the biggest problems I have with this game is the dice mechanics. So you are rolling a D6 dice pool, and all that matters are sixes. I don't have the math in front of me. I probably should have grabbed it. But when you're rolling like five or six dice, which is pretty much your standard roll in this game, your odds of success are like 52%. Now, I'll admit, when you push, you're up to like 80%. So the game obviously wants you to push. But even with that 80%, it is so hard to succeed at a skill roll, even when you have all the cards on the table. When you've got a character there trained in the skill, it's, it's one of their favorite skills. They happen to have a keyed item that's of the right type. They have two other characters with them helping, and you still fail. And in a role-playing game, I have no problem with that. Because in a role-playing game, failure, especially a well-written role-playing game, a failure is interesting. And the Tales from the Loop role-playing game is all about making failure interesting and getting your kids into deeper and deeper trouble is part of the fun. That doesn't work in a board game. In a board game, when you fail, you just fail. You, you wasted your cubes. You didn't get the thing. You now get penalized with Enigma. Like it's, it's, there's none of the reward for failing, but still keeps the honestly terrible odds from the role-playing game. And that I find is a major failing in this game as a board game. Now, if you're a role player, you may not mind this, right? Especially if you're used to the dice and fails from the loop and you're really used to knowing, yeah, I never make a test unless I have six dice or whatever. That might not bother you, but for a standard hobby board gamer, I think this is going to be a problem for a lot of people. Absolutely. I think there's there's some 
some real concern when you take this mechanic from from one to the other. You know, this whole episode we've been talking about board games and RPGs uh, and and how they interact. And in many ways, it's great. But in this one particular choice of dice rolling mechanic, Mm -hmm. a, a dice pool that requires a single value success where there is no failure modifier like there's no there's no good things or 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 even range of bad things that happens for failure it's either yeah there's no success fail. with the complication right it's pass or fail and the odds of passing are terrifyingly low yeah. from a board game player's perspective yes now that said i don't want to totally ruin the game here and say it's terrible because of that because otherwise there's some really cool stuff going on here. You honestly get that I'm playing a kid feel. You get the parents don't listen to me. I have to do it all myself. Except for the car ride thing, I guess. Um, which does lead to another weird rule where you can't give other kids rides. That's another thing I personally hate. I, I think there should be a rule that you, if you're with another kid and they get a ride, you can get a ride with them. But anyway, um, I love the, 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 again, the physicality of the game. The game looks fantastic, feels fantastic. Don mentioned how innovative and interesting the card mechanic system for for keeping you working works. The world is interesting. They even give you a source book on the world, which I you don't get in most board games, unless they're historical where they present whatever battles happening. You don't tend to get a background book. So that's really cool. Um, but the RPG like moments of this game are amazing and and make up for me all the problems. When I'm sitting there and we're debating what to do in our turn, it's like halfway through a day and everyone's used up a few cubes and you're like, all right, look, if we just move over here and I scout the machine, then we get to see it, what it's what its hacking ability is. Then the rest of you move up, we'll attempt the hack, but first we got to get past the watchdogs. Now to get past the watchdogs, you're the fastest. So you should ride up there on your bike first because you'll get to make the roll and then you can help us get past the watchdogs. And then... The character of the bike's like, dude, I can't. I have to go to hockey practice. If I lead you guys up there past the watchdogs, there's no way I can make it to hockey practice. And you have an actual in-game argument going, look, it's Thursday. You have tomorrow. You can go to hockey practice tomorrow. And you convince the other player to go to do it, and then they go. Well, you get to the fence, and he leads the guard dogs away, but then one of the other characters has to make a strength test to make it over, and another player decides to help. And they boost him over the fence, but they fail. And they get hurt. The other player that helped ends up being scared because they saw another kid get hurt. And that all happens mechanically in a board game. And then there's a later role where you're going to ro do the robot. And the player's like, hey, can you help me with this? Or like, hell no, I'm not touching anything like that. Remember when you hopped over the fence and you got all cut up? I'm not helping you. Like these were actual conversations and things that happened in a board game, not a role playing game. Absolutely. And you know what? It's again, there's there's this depth of of play that's there in the game. Uh, and in some ways, that's helped by the fact that you're failing all the time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. You still want to have the chance to win. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things that this uh, that this sort of thing has done is they have taken away a lot of the quarterbacking. So there okay. is no turn order. There is no, no me, you, you know, everyone can go anytime. If one person wants to take all their hours and be done and then it's everyone else's turn, that's a totally legitimate strategy. Uh, but because of everyone's little, you know, chores and things uh, and, and their, their plans to, you know, when they want to finish their chore or when they have mm -hmm. to finish their chore, there's, there's a little sort of wedge in there that stops you from being able to effectively quarterback, even if you wanted to. So if you right. went, went into the game, planning on quarterbacking to a win you would have a very very hard time achieving that uh without playing it solo essentially no i totally agree with that so we're talking about how bad the die rolls are right so so like the concept's awesome the mechanics work the mechanics for making again except for the dice roll odds but like the spending hours to do things. I, I particularly love the, the parent happiness mechanics actually just work really well. Um, one of the results, if the watchdogs catch you, 
is you get bagged in tag and that upsets your parents, which is really easy to get grounded for getting bagged in tag. But when you get bagged in tag, you can keep still doing what you were doing. It's just now your name's on record. Like there's some really awesome stuff there. The problem is the next problem is playing with high player counts. Now the first four games we played of this, we played with four or five players. And honestly, we thought the game was impossible. Not only is there the dice roll problem, there is a whole system with the rumors. Now, you have four rumors out. You probably want to try to solve all the rumors if possible, but at least some of them, just to get your enigma or your insight, like to prevent the enigma and get insight. And possibly that's also your way to get items and things. And also really cool tech called anomalies. That's another thing I didn't get into before, but you want anomalies. Trust me, they're good. Anomalies are a good thing in this game. Um, But to do that, you got to do the rumors. Then at the start of every turn in the school phase, at the top of that school card that tells you what happens, it tells you how many rumors to put out. Now, most cards say player count. It uses icons for this. Some cards say player count minus one. And in the basic deck, two cards say player count minus two. Now, this has a minimum of one. So no matter how many players you're playing with, you're always going to get one rumor and a max of four. Now, this sounds like it all works, but when you are at five players, almost every time you are going to draw all but two cards in an entire deck you are going to draw four new rumors which means if you haven't solved every rumor every round you're going to get penalized with enigma which is generally two enigma and in one scenario it's three enigma for just for them getting pushed off the board with five players we found the game to be impossible you just couldn't do all the rumors let alone still try to solve the mystery. Like, like the rumors aren't the main part most of the time. You're usually trying to do other things. And this goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about travel. So mm-hmm. again, you've got six cubes to move around the board. And that seems like a lot, six hours. I got tons of time and I can take the bus all the way up here. But the rumors get randomly distributed across the board. Mm-hmm. And if you're all starting at the school, it takes, without without using anything extraneous if you just want to get to the furthest location on the board it takes five hours yeah, five cubes so you have one cube to do something with and if you've got rumors out there or if you've got more than one rumor on that I'll path to get there it can't be done yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it it's just you run into these literal uh roadblocks with the rumor system and mm. and to me I was thinking about this earlier, and it's something that we never really talked about, I think. But because the the two game stats, the timers, uh, the good and the bad, are separate stats, it becomes a real problem, right? So as you as your your negative stat goes up, it hit it, once it hits a certain point, the game's essentially over. Uh, and what I think might have been a better strategy or a better game mechanic is if it was a tug of Scale. war. If, if, if it was a plus minus, so you started off at zero and as you passed your rumors, you got plus. And if you failed some rumors or, you know, the rumors got pushed off, they went to zero and you had, it felt like you had a chance to mm-hmm. get to a level you needed. Because this at, at this point, it just feels with these high player counts, I want to specify that, yeah. with the high player counts, it just feels like you're starting at the bottom of a hill and the avalanche already started. See, I'm not sure. It depends on the scenario. So, so unfortunately, Sean only got a chance to play in one scenario that we did try a couple times. Um, no, you tried no, two different two. scenarios. We did two different, yeah, two different scenarios. So I have played in scenarios that use both dials very effectively, where your enigma goes up a bit, things start getting interesting. So you haven't lost the game, just things escalate. Meanwhile, you're still getting the insight to solve problems. And that wouldn't work. Like, you couldn't have that. And I actually really enjoyed, again, there are a couple scenarios I recommend playing first. I really enjoyed the fact that like some enigma is kind of inevitable, especially with the dice pool system, but having it not be too punishing, which is what we saw in The Passenger and what we saw in The Light Fantastic, Light Fantastic specifically, stuff started to happen when the enigma went up, but it wasn't you lose. Whereas the one scenario you played, like the, the one with the film crew, definitely would be better as a sliding sale, I think. Right. That one in particular, bottom muck, I don't even know. Like, like bottom muck, 
Were you in the game where we got to like 48? No, Enigma? that was that was the first that, game. Okay, so that was the first time I played. Like the Enigma dial stops at 15 or something, and we had 48 by the end of the game, which was interesting because it didn't matter. Like that wasn't a lose condition. So we were just like, let's let everything happen until we flip the card. And it was a lose condition. Right. And that's one of the ways we lost. But we did find out we could have won. So what I will say is we played multiple times and could not win at four or five players. And I haven't done it. I should have done it before the review. But I, I am certain that at five players in certain scenarios, if you passed every die roll and did everything right, you still couldn't win. Be well, you could. But only if you drew the minus twos and minus ones on all the time on the rumors or all your rumors are on the main island. Like, like it's, it, it's honestly broken. Like yeah, without, I hate without, calling a board game broken, but without playing it through, we, we, we did some sort of mind gaming of it and tried to imagine, okay, what had, what would have happened last night? What if, if we, we had passed, passed every, every single role and it still didn't feel like we had had a chance. Yeah. And, and, and we know, and we say this regularly on this show, if you're playing a co-op game, you shouldn't win the majority of the time. It no. should be hard. It should always it be should close. Be a struggle, though. but it should be close. The impossibility is what breaks the game, and that's one yeah. of the things that my kids have really had a hard time with about some of the, uh, some of the some of the uh, the co-op games that we've played with Hogwarts, where they have just felt from like you know right up start. You know the way the mm -hmm. the way it all dealt out, the way the starting condition became it it was downhill from from then and and that's really what these high player count versions of this game in the scenarios that i've played were feeling like i honestly have a player who refuses to ever play the game again like not even give it a try even after i've tried to redeem the game which does happen as long as you play with three or less players this game works perfectly smoothly at less than four players now i know as board game geek still somehow says four three to four players as being the sweet spot and i still wonder if that four is there from the prototype version of the game so let's get into that for a second before i get into three player play one of the issues i have with this game is it does not have the best written rule book it is a rule book written by role players who are definitely not board gamers and they like to hide rules all over the place now, there is multiple page threads on Board Game Geek with rule questions. And interestingly, every single one, the designer was able to point to the rule in the rule book. Now, the problem is the designer had to point to those rules in the rule book, and there are multiple pages where they've had to do this. So I honestly don't can't say it's a good rule book, but I will say everything's in there somewhere. It's just not necessarily where you'd expect it to be, or it may not be clear how it's written. But I do strongly recommend you go on Board Game Geek and read those threads. The other problem, though, is this game was originally released. Um, I, I don't know what order these came in. So there was a print and play version released as part of the Kickstarter. There was also a Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator, I forget which, version of the game released. Those two have different rules. Even more so, the retail finally final version of the game is very different from both of those. And when looking for rule questions, you will often find videos and FAQs for the older versions. And if you go on the board game geek thread, you'll eventually find a point where it says anything from this point on is the old game and this is the new game, but sorry, I don't have that number in front of me. But like I watched watch it played videos that didn't match what I read at all. Some examples are the player boards look completely different where each action spot had a set number of cubes that would fit in it. That's something that's been completely eliminated. Another is you used to have to spend a time cube to help. That's been eliminated. So if you're reading or watching anything that has those two things, you're watching old information. And and we should say that not only is this, you know, a, a, a an interesting game, no one has said this is an easy game. This is rated, this has got a weight of 3.3. Yep. This is listed as a heavy, uh, medium heavy, heavy game. Uh, this is not something, this is not family weight, even even at the lower player count where it's, it's uh, you know, it, it is a, an achievable game. It's not a family weight game. This no. is a thinker. Yeah, the, this and it's fiddly. There are lots of tokens. And like Sean said, you've got cards and you draw new cards and you flip some of the cards and some cards get discarded. Then you put new cards into play. Like that's all part of it. There's the cubes you're moving around. There's the, the number of different actions you have, especially once some of those cards start adding new actions. You're tracking two different stats. There's all the items you can combine. There's just a lot going on. Now, getting back to three-player count, three-player count, the game honestly works. Like, the first time, 
what we sat down and won a game was on April 1st. And I purposely didn't I want to say, hey, we won. But like we were so happy because we hacked a robot, rode that robot, and won an encounter all in one game. And that felt so awesome. And I we have never hacked a robot at four or five players. It just never happened. There was always something that stopped us, or it was just too many checks to make to be able to do it. Being able to actually do that was so much fun. The hacking system, when you hack a non-alert robot with only three players, is actually enjoyable and seems very doable. And yes, we had to push twice and we had to use items to do it, but sure, that's fine. We were able to succeed. And that ability to ride a robot actually was neat and cool and fun, where a robot took us over the water to be able to get to this area we needed to get to, and that was neat to see. So I'm sorry to say this is a three player game max, in my opinion, without house rules. And now maybe that house rule is you always do whatever the card is for rumors minus one. So that there's a way better chance, because that was the thing with three players, we would solve four rumors and sometimes only one new rumor would come up. You got three blank spots. You can basically let everything go, because even if you get player count, which gives you an entire day where you don't have to worry about trying to solve the rumors. You can focus on the story. That's the turn where we all gathered together and hacked a robot because we didn't have to worry about the rumors. It honestly, with three players, it's your choice if one of the rumors gets bumped because you're always going to be able to do it. You're going to be able to do enough rumors that you don't lose points for ignoring them, which that just feels better. It's it's more enjoyable. It fits the theme better. Like like just ignoring things and losing because you couldn't possibly do them is disappointing. Whereas when it's your choice, you're like, look, we're gonna gain some enigma, but right now we're almost there. We've almost got access to the UFO club. We're gonna get the secret password. We're good to go. You know what? This turn, let's just focus on that and ignore that. And no, we're gonna get the enigma. Then it becomes a player choice and not a punishment. There's also some interesting stuff, and this doesn't really come up much, and I think it's something that you've overlooked uh, just as kind of part of what's going to happen. But the items in the game can at times sort of take you out of things. Uh, there are things like um, one of the items is makeup, which yep. gives you a boost in charm and can help you hack a robot. <laughs> You know, well, no, nothing can help you hack a robot. That is not something included in the retail version of the game. Items have help you hack nope. a robot. Yeah. Oh, nope. not at all. None of the robots have any keywords for hacking. It's something that must have been removed in the retail version. But why they're they're all colored for well, the, yeah, you can right. use them that way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you can use them that way. Yeah. No, uh, but that makes sense with a watchdog because it's trying to identify you and bag and tag you, and you put on makeup to disguise yourself as someone else. Come on, it's based on a role-playing game. Uh, but there, there are things like Sorry, that. There, there, that is something I did want to bring up. There, there, supposedly, the rule book mentions that there are combos you can use to hack a robot. There are not. And I don't know if that was something in an earlier yeah, no, version. Or something this is the st- just the this skill was just the using stat AI. I thought you were talking about... No, no, no. Stat you bonus. were using makeup with a thing to hack no, a no, robot. Stat, no, stat bonus for charm. Stat bonuses. Okay, yeah, that's different. Sorry, that was me misunderstanding. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's... There, there's certainly some thematic things that 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 could nec- could leave people cold. Uh, one of the things is this game feels like the robots should be a massive part all the time. Yes, and they aren't. And by <laughs> putting giant miniatures out of them, yeah, it just kind of makes you think they should matter. Yes, and, and 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 it is very scenario dependent. It's very scenario dependent. They're always there, but a lot of the times they're completely ignorable. Yes. Um, whereas there are certain scenarios where if you don't go in and hack them there's just no possible way yes uh and that's that feels odd uh because they really do feel like a major component they've got these Mm -hmm. big cards at the top and these giant miniatures and they they take up a lot of space on the board and and it really feels like you need to focus on them but because the game has put so much effort into them but you don't yeah not necessarily on a, a the robots have come up in most of the ones I played. Like obviously bottom muck is called bottom muck. Um, so so one so a couple things about this uh before we get to some very final thoughts is this feels like a board game of a role-playing game. 
this does not feel like your standard Euro game, your standard, you know, Steffenfeld resource management or anything like that. This is definitely trying to be a role-playing game and get elements of that role-playing game in there. And I think it succeeds at that. The problem is it brings in the trappings of role-playing games, like the dice pool system, which I really don't think works in this. And then I don't honestly know what happened with the player count. Like, like I'm wondering if it's something that happened from those iterations from print and play to, again, they might be in the other order, digital to print and play whenever they came out where print and play to digital to final game. I think something broke in there. And I don't know if it was people complaining that things aren't easy, difficult enough or not. But like in the back of the rule book, though, there is a section on how to make the game easier and harder. Take that to heart and make the game easier when you first start playing. Like take every hack you can. Like there's some really simple ones that just make sense. Like characters who are helping can contribute their items to the main role. Why not? If I'm there with you, why can't I hand you my cable or my hair or take my bike? Like it just fits. Things like that. Um, there's other ones back there. I can't remember exactly what they are. You probably won't need the ones to make it more difficult. The other thing you might want to house rule is many of the scenarios will require numbers of things, set numbers of uh, insight that are higher for higher player counts. Just don't make that adjustment. Just use whatever the lowest is. Because like we played a scenario where it's like you need nine to win with three players, but you need 18 to win with five. And the way the game works, having two more players does not double your ability to solve rumors, especially when only the rumor cards with the right symbols on them count. Like there's something that broke there when, when adjusting the player count. Like maybe it was only a four player game originally and they decided to squeeze in a fifth player and something fell apart there. The other thing, and I've mentioned it before, do not play bottom muck as your first scenario. You might not ever want to play bottom muck. For one, it's one of the only two-week scenarios, and this game gets long when you play two weeks. Very long, like more than three hours long with two weeks. Stick to the one-week scenarios, and I strongly recommend you start with the Light Fantastic. The reason I suggest that is it removes a chunk of the mechanics from the game so you don't have to worry about them, and I don't want to spoil what but you want to start with that one. If you want to experience everything in the game, like if you want a taste for everything for your first game, then do the passenger. So I recommend the light fantastic. And then once you beat light fantastic, play the passenger from there, do whatever you want. Uh, the plant one was particularly fun. I will say um, there, there are some other ones bottom muck. I, 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 we had such a bad experience with that trying to learn with, I have no interest in ever playing bottom up. There are other scenarios. There's a good number of them in there. The, the tape one is actually would be fun with three players. The the where you your characters have found a videotape and you're just gonna go around and film all the weird things happening because of the loop. Again, the scenarios are fantastic. The theme is fantastic, but there are some problems with this game. Yeah, no, I have to say, you know, after my experience playing five player, two different scenarios, if if I didn't know that that Mo had played it at three and 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 found a vastly different experience yeah. i would walk away from this game and never consider mm -hmm. playing it again uh it's only because i trust that you know when he says no no it really is a better game at three yeah. uh, that i can trust that opinion that i would ever sit down again and try it at three players to get that experience and get the bad taste out of my mouth which is yeah. what the five player experience really left yeah and sean's not the only one like i said i have a friend who, who who refuses to play and I have another one that I convinced to give another try gave it another try I was like okay I can see it I can see how this could be fun but I'm still not interested in playing it again I'd rather play other games that are on your shelf so very much so this game is not for everyone this is not in any way a game your random euro I like hobby board games fan should just go out and pick up this is a game for fans of tales from the loop who also happen to like fiddly, heavy, not unforgiving board games. But like, if you're a Catan player, or you love Uwe Rosenberg, or you like Food Chain Magnet, I'm just trying to pick a big range of hobby games. And you're like, oh, Tales from the Loop. I know nothing about that. That looks interesting. This is probably not the game for you. This is, to me, a game for fans. Fair enough. Now, role-playing game players, I will say maybe more forgiving because you've got your character sheets, you've got a, a resolution mechanic system that will seem familiar to many role players. You've even, even the whole system of taking injuries and something bad, something bad happened to push your dice is going to be familiar. 
So role-playing game players who are interested in board games that feel kind of like role-playing games may want to check this out, uh, especially if you're a Tales from Loop role-playing game fan, right? Tales from Loop role-playing game fans probably already bought this at this point. Um, you might you might enjoy it, right? If you're a D&D player or whatever, you, you may get more out of this than your average board game player would because of those RPG elements. Overall, should you buy this or not? It's going to be up to you. Um, if you're a Tales from the fan and completionist, why not? You're going to get some cool minis. You get some cool cards. You have a game that you may have some fun with. Other than that, this is probably a pass. Definitely a try before you buy. I almost think for every gamer, if there's a way for you to try it before you buy, do it. But again, remember that version on digital is not the version you'd be buying. And I have no idea if they have any plans to update that to match this retailer. All right, well, that's it for our review of Tales from the Loop, the board game. If you've tried this one out with your group, we would love to know if you had similar experiences, mm -hmm. which you can tell us about in the comments down below. I also invite you to check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com, where I'm going to get into more detail, especially in regards to how to play the game, the actions, and maybe hacking. I can definitely put a lot more on the blog than I want to talk about in a podcast segment. So... Check that out for even more info on Tales from the Loop, the board game. And now the Bell Hops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, mostly it's been online plays. We got a ton of tables going for a while. A bunch of, a bunch of games ended, and we forgot, I forgot to hit rematch, so we're, we're rematching those. Um, I don't think we're going to get into digital plays unless you want to. About uh, anything in particular? Uh, mostly just the, uh, the space base. Playing yeah. real-time space space using its uh, helper feature where it automatically chooses when you don't have any, when there's no choices to choose is fantastic and makes for really quick gameplay. So if you want to play some space space, even at five player, you can bang out a game in half an hour. No problem. Nice. Yeah, I got to say, we uh, went on a lot about a very specific tabletop simulator mod and how good it was for space space. That's nothing compared to the board game. Yeah, now that it's on BGA... I'm board game with arena yes. version yeah, yeah. the the played on board game arena um does arcana makes no sense still that'll <laughs> be a, like even game two i don't know if it'll make sense we're trying that one out uh tapestry continues to be fantastic on there for implementation finally oh, got oh my god the civil... undo i finally uh, got new civilizations <laughs> oh nice undo I think there is some stuff in that the, the the interface now and then and what it lets you undo and what it doesn't let you undo i it's last like, game Dan, last game i i i wanted to go all the way back because i realized halfway through the turn i'd made a mistake but yeah. i could only go back to the point just after i made that what mistake. you wanted to do yeah like diana did a thing that got her nothing then instead of confirming your end of turn it automatically went to you and it literally said it, what it was is she took the thing that let you bump up any track and tried to bump up a track she was already at the top on or something i forget now right or she tried to use an action on a spot and that spot was going to have her get a tech, but there were no tech. Oh no, that's what it was. She was going to explore. So she used the action that lets you use another action. You're already on chose an action where she gets to explore. Didn't realize that she was surrounded. She didn't have any adjacent open tiles. And instead it went, Deanna can't explore. And it became your turn. Right. So like, that was huge. Like that's the, one of the biggest moves in the game is to use a spot you're already on. And yes, yeah, she missed the thing. But like I had similar ones and I'm like, oh, the, the, the undo sometimes is more frustrating than having no one do, I think. Yeah, it's it's and I know I know what it's based on. I know that it's when you when another player has seen an action on the board that you can't come back from that. But then don't show the other players anything. It's a computer game. There's no reason. But what he did didn't even show anything. Yeah, like it didn't it's... reveal anything new. So yeah. it wasn't even that. Like it just said it gave her an error, basically. It showed a warning. Right. You will get nothing from this. Big bop set up. And it said, you will get nothing from this. And then Sean's turn. Like, no. Right. Well, if I'm going to get nothing, then let me back up. Yeah, that's crazy. So other than that, it's still a really good implementation. I'm really digging it. Um, Azul plays really good on there. I don't know. We we have all the games we usually have been playing on there going. Trying to figure out Res Arcana. Everyone loves it. I think I need to play res arcana in person like i'm having sean's problem i even read the rules and i'm like i have no idea what i'm doing and everyone loves that game it's from the designer of race for the galaxy and it's fantasy i should dig it but i don't know what's happening yeah i need to sit all. down maybe does paul have a video on that one i can watch oh probably someone's gotta have a video 
I'm sure someone's got a video. Hey, Dave, you missed a very rambling, rambling topic, but we'll get to that in the after show. All right, let's move to physical games. So speaking of games with problems, um, Brento finally played at five players. I, I, I feel bad. Like, we have no obligation to review Garento. We did do a preview of Garento, and we got to show you off the prototype copy, which was awesome. We loved that game. Kickstarter was fantastic. Got the Kickstarter version. I like it so much, I want to review the final product. I want more people to know about Garento. The problem was I played it many, many times with all the variant rules and never played with five players. And honestly, I still haven't played with solo either. That's another one on the list. Finally played with five. And I was confused because when you play with five, you add five of each colored tile to the bag. This made no sense to me because when you play Garinto, every round with four players, there are two tiles that are not taken. Well, if there was, and they're just removed from the game at the end of the round, and you keep them beside the board so you can count tiles and know how many are left. Why wouldn't when you're playing with five, just have people like the, the fifth player would take those. There would be no removed tiles. Instead, the instructions say throw in 25 new tiles in the bag. I'm like, okay, so we did it. We're like, all right. So besides why, it completely messed the distribution of all the tiles. In our game with this, we had way too much wind. We had six wind on the first round. And by the end of the game, there were more wind tiles than anything else. And I'm like, I guess if you want that random element, but like that sounds like one of those catch-up mechanics for kids that people put into games they shouldn't. Like this is an abstract strategy game. There should be an equal number of every element. And then thematically, the whole game's about balance. Why is there no balance? So I'm like, why would they do this? This is just strange. And then Kat was the one who went, wait, maybe they want you to put 25 more tiles on the board. And sure enough, it's a five by five grid. So there are 25 towers, 25 piles on the mountain, it's called, right? So we're like, oh, that's what we'll do next game. So we, we I think we played two games the first way, but whatever. So now we play it and we put the tiles in and we put it out and we put an extra stack. And sure enough, that worked pretty well. Where here we have perfect balance. You use every tile in the bag. Interestingly, every tile is drafted like from the mountain like every tile is going to get used none are pulled out plus well that first game the mountain got low at the end of the game it did get kind of empty like it was the two last turns where one player had a choice of getting one tile or another tile and then the other player was stuck with that tile so that literally removed a decision point completely from the last player they were forced to take a move player before only had two choices and honestly it was no choice because it happened to be the same colored tile I'm like, okay, I get it. That is a problem. That by doing the additional mountain build at the beginning, we didn't have that problem. The board like had some empty holes, and that's always part of the game. So it ends up that seemed like the right way to play. So I wrote our contact. I, I wrote Mr. Mark Spector, and I was like, "What's going on here? This is a little strange. Why do you do this?" Well, it ends up there is a misprint, and I feel so bad because this game's so awesome, and it sucks because. Not everyone's on Board Game Geek. And if anyone like goes into a store and buys it and has this expansion, they're going to have a card that does not tell you to add an additional tile to every stack in the mountain. So fair warning, if you've got Garanto, you play with five, that's what you do when it works. So a little disappointed. I'm just bummed because I'm like, this game's pretty much perfect. Like th there's little minor things I'd fix. That's like a full rule of mission. And I'm like, damn it, you miss. I hope there's a second printing just to fix that. That's a shame. Yeah, no, I mean, we a lot we love Garinto. Unfortunately, it was sad we didn't have time to get down and to play it last time I was down. But uh, it is well, the game wasn't even here. <laughs> yeah, well, we didn't know that at the time. We were going, <laughs> but we were uh, just busy. Yeah, no, I was that I was fun. All right, next Tales from the Loop with three. I think I covered this all above. I don't really have a lot to say. Finally tried it with three. The first game with three was close enough that it felt like that loss in a co-op. The one you want. The, the it was close enough you just want to try again right we got to experience that then we played another game with three and you know what we won we actually won a game we approved we won it's all about those rumors uh if you were going to play with four or five players house rules something i don't know what but i am thinking minus one 
to the number of cards that come out with four players and minus two if you're playing with five players. Even if the game seems easy, at least you get to experience the story and have the fun because that's what's good about this game. You get to play kids who solve mysteries and get to see the whole story. They're still branching paths. You're not going to lose anything by losing the game. Like maybe your most overly competitive friends are going to have a problem, but then go play an overly competitive Euro instead of playing Tales from the Loop. No, totally fair. Then I think I talked, did I talk about this one on this show at all? I don't think I have. I don't think so. No, No, I don't think I have. So I talked about this on the what you play because I did one last week, even though we didn't have a podcast. That's why. So I have a pre-release copy of Founders of Teotihuacan. This is from Board and Dice, same company that does all the tea games, and is a follow-up to Teotihuacan. This is not an expansion. This is a standalone game. This is a very quick, comparatively, abstract Euro action bidding tile laying game where you are building your own section of the city of Teotihuacan, including a giant pyramid in the beginning, trying to build three different types of resource generation buildings, gold, wood, and stone, which you're going to use those resources to build temples in four different, or three, three different colors, temples in three different colors. You're going to paint the main pyramid, and if the colors match up, stuff happens. You're also trying to cover up parts of your board to get mass. There's a whole bunch of things going on using one of the coolest action selection systems I've seen. And to me, it's totally unique. Maybe maybe there's another game out there, and I'd love to hear about if there's another game out there that uses this, but there are a bunch of action spots on the board that are represented by discs that give you a bonus. When you go to move, you pick one to three of your own discs to put on top of what's already out there. The power of your action is based on the total number of discs. So one disc starts out there, And then say on my turn, I put one disc out. Well, if Sean now plays on me, he gets a three power action for only one disc. Does that kind of make sense the way that would work? The max stack is four. And I really love this action selection mechanic. The first person to place gets to do the bonus that's on the disc. And there's a whole bunch. Now you're using this to place buildings, resource buildings, of course, generate resources. And there's a neat spatial thing here where you actually have to put your resources on the board and they take up room. Like you're putting out resources around your buildings if they're orthogonally adjacent. Then when you're spending them, you're taking off your board. And that's kind of cool. Um, you're covering up things. You're, you, there's a whole point salad thing going on where whenever you build a temple, you get to take a favor of the god. And one of the actions is turn in one of your favors. And these favors are all tied to different things like trade 10 wood for 12 points or show that you have two green buildings for eight points. Whole bunch of things going on here, but it plays in about an hour. Even with four players, I'd say an hour and a half. If you get to know the game, it's going to be down to an hour. So you got a really neat bidding action mechanic I've never seen before. You got a tile laying game and you're building poly, what do they call them? Polyomino buildings to build better polyomino buildings that'll give you points as long as they're tied to your center temple as a kind of overview. What totally caught me was the second time we played, I realized this is a simple version of Founders of Gloomhaven. And there's no way that's a coincidence. There's no way being called Founders of Teotihuacan and the other one's called Founders of Gloomhaven. There is not an overlap there. No, it's not the same designer. Isaac made Founders of Gloomhaven. I don't know if there's someone who loved it or what. Now, Gloomhaven is this complex polyomino game where your resource buildings have to make a connecting line to your production buildings that connect to a point building. And then everyone who owns a building along the way gets points and it's super heavy. This is way simpler with the putting your resources on the boards and everyone has their own board instead of building on a central board. But here you have a polyomino game where you're building resource buildings to build point buildings, which at its core is what Founders is. And I thought that was fascinating. Like I totally missed that there was a relation there. And I've yet to see an official confirmation of that, but I can't see how it's not. It just doesn't make sense. So now we do have a prototype copy, or sorry, pre-release copy of this. There are a couple things they will be changing. So no, any pictures I share online in that, there will be a couple improvements. Like they didn't quite give us enough resource cubes in the game. So the, that will be something that we're guaranteed will be fixed. I think if you, even if you, if you like Teo, check this out. Because this is a, it gives you some of that feel of Teo. It's got some of the same themes, though it's a very different game. Um, yeah, I think you'll enjoy this. But if you hated Tao, you might still like this because this is a very different title of game. This is a, this is a quick, thinky polyomino game with a really cool mechanic for taking actions. I, I think a lot of people are going to like this one. 
I think there's going to be a downfall of everyone thinking this is an expansion and no one's going to buy it, which hopefully they can get enough marketing out there to convince people of that. Uh, interestingly, Board and Dice says outright it is not related to founders it is, of though. Gloomhaven. But it is. You're Board putting down polyomino buildings that make things and connecting them to polyomino buildings that make coins. Yeah, Board and Dice how, says how can unrelated. They claim that? How can they claim that? I, I, there's too many similarities. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe, uh, someone maybe was they don't, inspired maybe, they, by. maybe they're saying that, and uh, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac's lawyers are hearing it. To, for for Isaac's lawyers Stop. to hear, I don't know. That was weird. You just completely cut out. Oh, that's weird. Well, how All about right. a look ahead? Uh, what do you have planned for the coming weeks? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm, <laughs> this week has been so busy. Um, actually, I would I would like to play. Um, I, we're we got to get some charter stone in. So Tori and Cat came over, and by the time we got there, were personal issues. I don't know what a kid kid parent things happening. So it made last Friday a little interesting. And and after playing Tales from the Loop and Founders of Teotihuacan, and Tori was like, "Oh hell no, I can't think enough to play Charter Stone," which is impressive because like I, I tend to forget that he was the person who hated any Euro game at one time like when, when we first started hanging out he hated games that made him think it was like no i feel like i'm doing homework i don't want to feel like i'm doing homework i'm here to have fun and we've obviously slowly won him over and it's that whole board game progression where you know you start off with these light games and you're like then light games seem a little too light and you try some heavier and then those games that you think were like oh my god that blows my brain like terraforming mars is now like oh it's just a tableau building game and you're managing multiple resources what's so hard about that and i think that's happening to him but he does hit a limit he's like no i've thought too much tonight we, <laughs> like, like we can play some you know it's games he knows really well like we can play some azul or we can play some garento light stuff but like no charter stone especially not a legacy game where what he does is gonna carry over yeah. so we need to get some charter stone in. i'm actually thinking this friday we might start with it just to make sure we get in at least one game Fair. i'm really looking forward to playing pompeii now, I hadn't played Pompeii in forever. I had played my friend Jamie's copy, and all I remembered it was about people running away from Volcano, and it was kind of neat. At that point, I think I was still getting into hobby board games, like modern hobby board games. So, like, I was a fan of more Euro Catans and Power Grids at that time. And I was like, this is neat, but a little light. Well, this is the other part of the journey. Eventually, you get to these super heavy games, and you're kind of like, nah, you know, now and then I like a nice quick hour game that has some thought to it. And I think I'm back there and I'm like, I want to give that one another try. I'm really curious to try out discoveries and just see what the heck that's about. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm just reading the chat, which I don't need to repeat. Um, what else? We don't, uh, well, we might have an unboxing we need to do. We're currently caught up on unboxings, except for I do have a pack to show open. Um, we, and we got to finish Goonies. Uh, again, a sale hit, like a sale hit early on Sunday. So here we are. We're like, we're going to do this. And then we're going to do this. And D was working on taxes. Then we're going to go to Brenda's. We're going to eat. Then we're going to play Goonies. And then we'll get home around seven or eight. And the sale should be just starting and populating. Meanwhile, D's doing the taxes. And I'm writing her at three o'clock. And I'm like, um, it's live. Oh, it's it's not only live. It's big. There's a lot of games in the sale. And like we still went over for dinner and I felt bad because we basically just went over to Brenda's, ate her food and came back. <laughs> well, at least I did, me and me and one of the kids. Uh, so we didn't actually get to finish Goonies. So we I, I would like to finish Goonies this week, which hopefully we'll review next week. I think I think that's probably on the table. And who knows what else? We'll, we'll keep we got lots of games going on board game arena. Uh, hopefully no new sale launches next week. So I, you know, like Saturday, I can be like, yes, I don't have to think about this anymore. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon uh, backers, our VIP guests. We greatly appreciate their support. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks, Brian. David Miller Jr., welcome to the chat. I hope D&D was good, and thank you for today's talk. Brian Kurtz, thanks, Brian. Jeff and Sheila Seuss, congratulations. We got the shower invitation, and we'll be sure to drive by. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and I got to go start selling and sharing Amazon sale deals. Follow at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, or go to good geek deals on Facebook, or go to tabletopbellhop.com and just look at our recent articles where you'll see two different sales 
no, this is in the U.S. only. Sorry, fellow Canadians or anyone listening overseas. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com or find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice. And sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Now, I just remember most of you are listening to the podcast and the sale is long done and over, but those links still count. You can still follow Tabletop Deals because I'm always sharing deals. And if you go to Tabletop Bellhop, it won't be on the recent articles, but you can check out our Amazon sale page or our other pages. If you like what we're doing here and would like to make me have more free time and not have to share affiliate links all the time, it would be awesome if you went to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and helped us continue to make this show and not make me beg you for money all the time. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.